Good evening, and thank you for coming to Battling Authoritarian Regimes in Venezuela and Beyond, <clears throat> a conversation with Leopoldo Lopez, an event jointly sponsored by the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies and the Harvard Venezuelan um, Student Association. The David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, or like we students like to call it, Dr. Class, was founded in 1994 by alumnus David Rockefeller as an interfaculty initiative. The center now has offices in Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, and is positioned to be intellectually poised to respond to real world changes in the Americas, resulting from democratic transitions and economic restructuring. The Harvard Venezuelan Student Association is a Harvard-wide organization that forms community bonds between Venezuelan students, faculty, and staff from diverse backgrounds. As its president, it is a privilege for me to welcome Leopoldo Lopez to Harvard in the name of the Venezuelan community. I know that he's happy to be back on campus too. Venezuela is facing one of the worst political, economic, and humanitarian crises in the world. Led by an authoritarian re regime that represses political opponents and systematically violates civil rights, the country has experienced the largest economic collapse outside of war in almost half a century. This discussion will focus on the fight against authoritarian regimes in Venezuela and beyond, based on former political prisoner and opposition leader Leopoldo Lopez. Today's, today's agenda will go as follows. First, Mr. Lopez, opening remarks, followed by Professor Hausman's own remarks. Second, a discussion between Mr. Lopez and Professor Hausman, moderated by Professor Steven Levitsky. And lastly, a Q&A from the audience. My colleague, my co colleague Mia Dal, will now introduce our two panelists and moderators. Thank you, Diego. And so I'm really happy and honored uh, to be able to introduce our three speakers for today, uh, starting with our key speaker, Leopoldo Lopez. Um, so Leopoldo Lopez is a former presidential candidate and opposition leader in Venezuela. Uh, he began his political career as a mayor of the Chacao district in Caracas, and he co-founded uh, the two, two of the most important opposition parties in Venezuela, Primero Justicia and Voluntad Popular. In 2014, uh, Leopoldo Lopez became a political prisoner of the Maduro regime, and he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. His arrest was widely condemned by the international community, and after three years in prison, he was released to house arrest in 2017, where he continued to lead the opposition movement in Venezuela. Today, he lives in, uh, in exile with his family in Spain, in Madrid, and Leopoldo Lopez is also an alumni from the Harvard Kennedy School where he studied his master in public, and, uh, public policy. Uh, we also have with us today Ricardo Hausmann, uh, that a lot of you know as the founder and director of the Harvard Growth Lab and a, a professor of international political economy at the Kennedy School. Uh, before joining at Harvard, uh, he served as the chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank and he also served as a Minister of Planning in Venezuela in 1992 to 93, and as a member of the board of the Central Bank of Venezuela. And then last but not least, we have Steven Levitsky, who is a professor of government and a director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies here at Harvard. Um, his research focuses on democratization, authoritarianism, political parties, and weak and informal institutions, with a focus on Latin America. He's also the author of How Democracies Die, uh, a New York Times bestseller book uh, that has been published in 25 languages. He's written and edited 11 other books that I won't mention here, uh, but we're really proud to have him as our moderator for this uh, event today. So with that, uh, I'll just give a big hand to our speakers and hand it over to Leo. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Mia. Thank you very much, Diego, and to Dr. Class as well, uh, Professor Levinsky and Ricardo. Thank you for being here. 
uh, and thank you to all of you. Uh, it's it's a great uh, to be here, and, and it's great for many reasons. Uh, I used to do this, uh, what Diego and Mia did uh, some years ago, more than 20 years ago, used to do it. Uh, every other week, we had an event about Venezuela. We had a, an organization called Forum Venezuela that then evolved into the, the structure that they have today, but it was uh, very fulfilling for all of us at the time. And I just want to tell all of you that um, you all uh, have a, a great privilege to, to be here in Boston, to be here at Harvard. Um, I certainly had the best opportunity to be here, to study here, to learn a lot, uh, and to take a lot of that learning back to Venezuela. So my, my journey, and I'll, I'll start by that, after I left uh, the Kennedy School in 1996, I'm an MPP in 1996, I went back to Venezuela uh, where I worked at PDVSA. I worked at the Office for Strategic Planning in PDVSA. Uh, I also uh, was teaching at the time. I was teaching at the economics um, uh, faculty in a Venezuelan university. And in 1999, when Chavez came to power, I decided to run for office. So I ran for the Constituent Assembly, which was the beginning of the end of the democracy in Venezuela. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't win. Um, the system was fixed from the beginning with uh, an electoral system that didn't take into consideration the representation, the representation of minorities. Uh, Chavez, with 53, 54% of the vote, packed the National Constituent Assembly with more than 90% of the representation. As, and again, that was the beginning of the end, but that's another discussion that we could have. Uh, after that, I mm, was unemployed, and I decided to run for office as mayor of my, my municipality in Caracas, in Chacao. I ran in the year 2000 and won. Uh, with a door-to-door -door campaign, some of the things that I learned here about campaigning at the Kennedy School, we took them there and we won. Uh, and I say we because we were a team of uh, very enthusiastic, very motivated um, young people that took the, the municipality and we did great things. Uh, I was re-elected in the year 2004 and that was the last time I was able to legally participate in an election in Venezuela. In the year 2008, I was running for the governorship of, uh, the, of Caracas, the uh, Alcaldía Metropolitana, and I was disqualified to run for office. I, uh, our team, again, it's a big plural, we were going to win, but there were no way uh, to take us uh, out of that race by the votes, so I was disqualified to run for office, and um, we decided uh, after that year, 2009, to articulate a movement, a political social movement, mostly of students, young people, young leaders, uh, social community leaders from all over Venezuela. So we went uh, all over Venezuela um, talking to people uh, about a, a new way of doing politics, but particularly with a clear commitment to confront uh, what was clear to us at the time that was a dictatorship. Um, those were the times up until the year 2013 where there was no clarity uh, about what was happening in Venezuela. There were all sorts of uh, adjectives uh, around the word of democracy to explain what was happening in Venezuela. It was a weakening democracy, it was a democracy in decline, it was a, a competitive autocracy, but there was uh, no, um, no assumption that what we were living was uh, a dictatorship. In the year 2013, I was not able to run for office again, uh, and I was the, the coordinator of the campaign, of the presidential campaign of Capriles uh, in April of 2013. We won that election, uh, but Maduro stole that election, and um, that created a lot of frustration among many Venezuelans, and we went around again to talk to Venezuelans all over our country. And in the year 2014, in January of 2014, Along with other leaders, we decided to call for the people of Venezuela to protest against the dictatorship. We had a messaging that was very clear against Maduro. We were calling Maduro a dictator. Uh, we were referring to Maduro as a repressor. Uh, we were talking about the links of Maduro to the cocaine trafficking and to his corruption. And that led to thousands of people to go out to the streets. Uh, we called for that street protest in January 23rd, which is uh, 
um, uh, a historical date in Venezuela because it's the date where the last dictatorship of Venezuela fell in 1958. Uh, in the, the then February the 2nd, the thousands of people went out to the streets and some people were arrested. And then we called for another protest on February the 12th, the, the day of the youth in Venezuela, to call for the release of those that were imprisoned or detained uh, some days before that. And that day at 3 p.m., uh, Basilda Costa, a young 21-year-old carpenter that was studying uh, administration during the evening, was killed with a shot in the back of his head. He was killed by the guards of um, Miguel Rodriguez Torres, who was uh, the Minister of Interior at the time. Uh, now Miguel Rodriguez Torres is serving, uh, uh, he's in prison, not because of this, but because he turned against Maduro. Uh, and they also killed two other people. That happened at 3 p.m. At 4 p.m. there was a warrant for my arrest. And uh, at 7 p.m. I was in hiding and I decided to, um, to go into hiding to decide how I was going to turn myself in. I had made the decision months before that coming to that point, I would turn myself in, um, quoting Martin Luther King, uh, in order to change the system, you need to show the scars of the system. In order to make people sensitive about the potrification of the system and make change come about. So I decided to turn myself in, in January the 18th of 2014, and I was taken to a military prison uh, in near Caracas, the military prison of Ramo Verde, where I spent the next four years of my life. Uh, I spent most of the time in solitary confinement. During that time, I was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The trial that I was um, that that, I, that that they did against me um, was because of the speeches that I was giving to the people of Venezuela. They didn't have a trial because of murder or because of uh, any other reason, but because of the speeches. And the allegation was that I was calling for the people of Venezuela to be violent and to do violent protests. So the, the, the entire trial was very Kafkaian in the sense that it was all about analyzing how, without saying to the people to be violent, how they became violent. So they brought in all sorts of experts, and the conclusion of the judge was that even though I didn't explicitly say that people should be violent, I was sending subliminal messages to the people of Venezuela, uh, and that created violence in, in, in our country. Uh, and I was sentenced to 14 years in prison in September of 2015. In 2017, I was uh, sent to house arrest uh, against my will after the ex-president of Spain came many times to my prison cell and the number two and number three of the regime came to, to my prison cell. Uh, and I explicitly said that I was against going to house arrest. However, they said very explicitly that it was a decision of Maduro. So I was taken to house arrest, and while being at house arrest, I again called for the support of the protests that were happening in the streets. So I was taken back to hell. I was taken back to prison, uh, and then I was taken back to house arrest. Uh, in the year 2019, um, during the support uh, protest and, and demonstrations, uh, for free and fair elections and for Fry, uh, Juan Guaido, uh, I was released by my own captors. I was released by the military and the police that had the responsibility of keeping me in house arrest. So I was freed in the morning of April 30th of 2019. Uh, things didn't go as we expected. I can go into all of the detail if you have some questions about that, because I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an event that there are some question marks around that. But um, the fact of the matter is that things didn't go as we expected, and we had to seek refuge in the Spanish embassy. So um, I spent the next year and a half at the Spanish embassy uh, that was taken again under siege by the authorities of, of Maduro. Uh, the electricity was cut, the water supply was cut, the trash services were cut, uh, but I stayed there with the ambassador, his wife, and, and the, a group of police officers that were taking care of the security of the embassy. Um, 
in the year 2020, in November of 2020, I decided to escape Venezuela um, for different reasons. I didn't, haven't seen my uh, family for six years, my father for six years, my mother for uh, three and a half years, my kids for two years, my wife for two years. My mother was very sick, uh, my father as well. Um, and I decided to leave Venezuela to escape uh, in order to um, become a voice of the Venezuelan um, opposition or the Venezuelan democratic forces for democracy. I was almost caught in, in my escape. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. I was able to cross the Meta River uh, to Colombia um, by the end of, uh, of November of 2020, and that took me to the situation where I am now. I am in, living in exile, and I am still in permanent contact with Venezuela, uh, but I am also thinking about ways and, and working around mechanisms that can contribute to um, making Venezuela free and having free and fair elections, which is what we have been um, calling for many, many years. Um, I would like to say a couple of comments after this brief review. Um, the first is, you know, wh what happened to Venezuela? How, how did we lose democracy? And I, I don't want to lose this opportunity being with Professor Levinsky. Uh, um, that his, his book, of course, is widely read. It's a, it's a must for anybody that wants to understand what is happening um, in, in democratic systems. Um, well, the first thing is that the Venezuelan democracy was not lost from one day to another. Uh, it was a process. But it was a process that started with, um, with, it, with um, winning the election with democratic means. So the killing of the Venezuelan democracy happened from within, happened from uh, within the institutions after winning elections, uh, and it was a gradual process. Freedom was, n was not lost from one day to another. Um, we gradually lost different freedoms. Freedoms is not one thing. Freedom is the sum of many things, and, and we lost um, all of the characteristics that one can say that freedom is all about one by one. Uh, unfortunately, it took many, many years uh, for us to understand that we were no longer living in a democracy. However, uh, it's just to say that since day one, the Venezuelan people stood to what was happening in our country. There were many, many manifestations, many attempts to bring about change. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened because the way in which the democracy was destroyed uh, has made it very, very difficult to the will of the Venezuelan people to be expressed through a free and fair election. Uh, it was a process that um, even the world analyzed from afar that was some sort of a, an interesting experiment. I remember the frustration coming to the US, to Europe, or to Latin American countries and talking to experts about what was happening in Venezuela, and many people were, um, well, giving a blind eye to the aspects of the Venezuelan process that were clearly against the democracy. Many people fell for the mirage that was created between 2004 and 2014 when the price of oil went from $15 to $150 per barrel. And many people were even uh, getting to the conclusions that even the economic proposals of Chavez were something that needed to be studied. Uh, that, the, that the model that Chavez was promoting was something of an example. It became an example, and it became part of a, of, a, of a process that affected the rest of Latin America. But that changed in the year 2014 uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, the prices of oil collapsed. The entire castle of, uh, uh, of, of cards started to collapse, but also because of the ugly face of the repression shown by Maduro after the protests. Up until the year 2014, the Venezuelan people, when asked, if Venezuela is a democracy or a dictatorship, um, the majority of the Venezuelan people said that it was a democracy. That happened uh, until the year 2014. Until uh, that, uh, since that moment, the Venezuelan people have clearly uh, understood that Venezuela is a dictatorship. And I believe that over the years, the world now clearly understands that what is happening in Venezuela is that we are living under a dictatorship. A couple of, of thoughts that I would like to share before, before um, giving the word to Professor Levinsky and Professor Hausman is that 
I would like to give you my answer to the question that mm, most people ask me um, wherever I go. People ask me, why is Maduro still in power? That, that's the question that I get from all sorts of people, from prime minister, presidents, ministers, or people, regular people in the streets. Why is Maduro still in power? I think there are many ways one could answer that question. You could answer that question alleging that, the, that Maduro is still in power because he has the, the power of the military or the support of the military. Uh, one could argue that Maduro is still in power because he has the capacity to still manage an important cash flow that allows him to have flexibility. Well, others could argue that Maduro is still in power because of the mistakes uh, or the lack of unity of the opposition. That's uh, an, an easy way out of, uh, of, of the complexity of, of the Venezuelan issue. Uh, but I have a different answer, um, and that's what I would like to share with you. I believe that one of the main reasons why Maduro is still in power is because of the international network of support that Maduro uh, and, and Chavez at his time they have. Maduro is still in power because he's not isolated from the international community. I remember in 2019 when Juan Guaido was um, um, elected the interim president, rightly so, constitutionally so, elected as the interim president of Venezuela, according to our constitution, I was recognized by the US and by other countries. I remember many people saying, well, Maduro is isolated. And that was simply not true. Maduro uh, was not being supported by the liberal democracies of the world, but he was certainly being supported by the autocracies of the world. And little that we knew at the time of the way in which autocracies were working together. So in my view, one of the main reasons why Maduro is still in power is because he's part of a very mighty and articulated network of autocracies that have given him support the same way they give support to each other. The countries that have given this uh, important support to Maduro are China with financial support, uh, Russia with military support and, uh, and others, and I'll talk about that, um, Turkey, Iran, Belarus, Cuba, and each one of those countries has been giving Maduro different types of support. Uh, but all of that um, leads to a conclusion that Maduro is not isolated. And what, when, when many people thought about what was going to happen with the imposition of sanctions to the Maduro regime in 2018, in 2019, uh, many people thought that Maduro was not going to be able to survive these sanctions because he would become isolated. Well, that didn't happen. He was not isolated. He just changed ecosystems. He changed the relationships of Venezuela from the ecosystem of liberal democracies and the economy that we knew up until that point to a different ecosystem, the ecosystem of the autocracies, of the network of autocracies. So he had the support of Iran, Russia, China, Belarus, of how to deal with sanctions, and of course Cuba. He had the diplomatic support of, of, uh, of these countries that orchestrated uh, a way to support Maduro from the, from the Security Council of the UN downwards. Uh, and if you see, if somebody takes their time to see the voting that has happened in all of these institutions from, as I said, from the Security Council down to any multilateral, one could see the pattern of support, even with the same wording, um, with the same uh, arguments that uh, he's been getting from these countries. So I believe that this is a reality that we now face, not only with the case of Venezuela. Uh, up until two months ago, whenever we spoke about this, um, it could have been an argument among many others. But I believe that now it has become very clear to all of us that liberal democracy is under attack, that the real confrontation worldwide is a confrontation between autocracy and democracy, uh, and that autocrats not only work to support each other, but are willing to, to go beyond what any rational uh, analysis uh, one could have about the decisions that they are willing to make in order to hold on to power and to destroy liberal democracies. Liberal democracies are under attack from within, and that is a reality here in the United States. It's a reality uh, in countries that are at risk, and of course, it's a reality in countries like Venezuela who are already living under autocracies. And they are under attack in a very 
yeah, clearly orchestrated way. And I'll just share with you one, one case that shows that this is, uh, that this is the case. Uh, in 2016, there was clearly the manipulation of the election by the, or, or at least of, of the social media by the Russians here in the US. It also happened with Brexit. It also happened with Catalonia. Uh, it, it all happened between 2016 and 2017. And when people that analyze the patterns of social media, one of the conclusions that they were able to reach is that those attacks were coming from Russia and from Venezuela. And this is a pattern that repeats in many other areas, which is the way in which these are countries that have um, a clear um, agenda to undermine, to weakening uh, democracies, and of course, to support autocracies wherever they are. And this is something that I believe uh, after the Russian invasion to Ukraine um, could lead to an opportunity, which is to understand what uh, this network really means to the, the, the liberal democracies in the world and to put all of us as individuals, as institutions, as corporations, as consumers, as countries, to uh, face to face with the question, what are we going to do about the fact that there is an attack to liberal democracies? I understand that democracies has, have a huge challenge. The main challenges that democracies have is that they are under delivering and this has weakening democracies all over the world because of their incapacity to solve the problems of the largest majorities of the populations, and that is true. But I can tell you at least my own personal position that I, that I much rather live under a problematic democracy than under an autocracy that promises to solve the problems of the people. Uh, and that's the question, that's a dilemma that we are facing today. And I think it's very clearly stated after the invasion to Russia. And I would like to end uh, by telling you um, what I've been doing over the past months. Uh, as I told you, I left Venezuela against my will. I, I never wanted to leave my country, but because of different reasons, I had to make that decision. Uh, and since I've been outside, I had the opportunity to meet other people. In May of last year, I came to the US and I met my lawyer uh, who helped me all throughout my time during prison. And he told me that if I wanted to meet other people that were like me, uh, political prisoners in the past. Uh, so we went to M Street. Um, we were having um, something to eat, something to drink. And I met with extraordinary people that, like me, were also political prisoners uh, from South Sudan from China, from Iran, uh, and my lawyer. All of us, because a coincidence, were graduates from Harvard. And that was a, that was a, a particular coincidence. Uh, and I, I, we were joking, you know, we might be the, the, the least wanted Harvard club on earth. <laughs> <laughs> the political prisoners Harvard club, nobody wants to join us. So we were there the political prisoners, uh, <laughs> Harvard Club, and, uh, and we were faced with, uh, with, with something that was very curious. We couldn't be more different. I mean, the, the, the color of our skin, the, religious, the religions we professed, the, the history of our countries, the continents we lived in, the economies of our countries. I mean, we couldn't be more different. But when we started talking about our experiences, it was like talking to somebody from my own political movement. It was talking to somebody who knew exactly you know, what was it like to face autocracies? The way we were treated, the way we were imprisoned, the way our families were attacked, the way we were subject to character assassination with all the might of the, of, of the autocrats, uh, the way our movements were crushed, the way we had to go into exile and reinvent ourselves. So since that moment, we decided to reach out to other people uh, that, like us, have been involved in working against uh, autocracies within their countries. So we are in the process of putting together an alliance of, of leaders and movements uh, that are working for freedom and democracy in, in many countries. So far, we're working with people from Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, Cambodia, Hong Kong, Bielorussia, Russia, um, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, um, and, and Cuba, and, and many others. 
And it's been very gratifying to see that, that there is a common ideal to defend. And I would like to end, and of course open to questions, which I think is the most important, by telling you something. When I was here during the 90s, there was a lot of idealism about freedom and democracy. Those were the times uh, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall. I mean, the Kennedy School was full of people wanting to go to Eastern Europe, to Latin America, to Asia, to promote democracy, to promote market economy. I mean, the idea was that it was inevitable that, uh, that democracy was the fate of any country in the world. And the spirit that I remember uh, when, when I studied here was a spirit very charged with, uh, with, with good idealism. I mean, people really thought that democracy was something worth defending, that, that freedom was an ideal worth working for. Uh, unfortunately, 20 some years after that, things have changed. And things didn't go out as people were thinking here at Harvard at that time and elsewhere. I mean, the history didn't end. Uh, and uh, it was not true that in order to have uh, democracy, you needed to have first a, a market economy. I mean, the idea that China was going to be democratized if it was going, if it was brought into the globalization process, and if uh, with economic growth that would have been a, uh, that a consequence of an economic growth would have been democratization. What well, we know today that exactly the opposite happened. There has been a recession of democracies. Over the past 16 years, democracies have been on decline year on year, and autocracies have been on the rise year on year. So exactly the opposite has happened. And I believe that one of the most important things that we need to regain is the idealism, the reasons why it's worth it to fight for democracy and for freedom. And I understand that, I, that this is an argument that swims against the current, because today it's very common to criticize democracy. It's, it's very easy to talk about how dysfunctional democracies has be, have become, and that might be true. But however dysfunctional democracies are, I can tell you, at least from our own experience, that I'd rather live in a dysfunctional democracy that in a, than in a functional autocracy. And those are the options. And those options are options that need to be made by individuals, by governments, uh, and, uh, and by corporations as well. One of uh, the ideas that we are discussing is to promote the discussion of the responsibility of corporations. All of you know what ESGF is about, environment, social, and governance. That's the lens through which one understands the, 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 the equilibrium of a corporation or, or the commitment to a, of a corporation to these values that we all hold uh, very important. However, I believe that there is an additional letter that should be other, uh, added to those three, which is the F. I believe that it should be ESGF for freedom. And we as consumers and individuals should have the possibility to understand if a good or a service is being manufactured or provided from a country that is working under an autocratic regime. Because autocracies are feeding from capitalism. They are taking the advantage of market economy. They are taking advantage of the consumption that is happening in liberal democracies. And most of that economic growth uh, or part of that economic growth is being used to repress um, the people from within to violate the human rights and to attack liberal democracies elsewhere. So my call to you uh, today is to reflect on, on how committed we are to these values, how committed we really are to freedom and democracy, uh, and to understand that today, um, like Venezuela, but I believe elsewhere as well, uh, we are under the threat of autocracies. I am very optimistic about the possibilities of bringing democracy back to Venezuela. It won't be easy. I, I, I couldn't say uh, how long it will take, but I am optimistic because I know that the large majority of the Venezuelan people want democracy to happen, want, are willing to continue to fight for democracy. It has been long. We have been at the height and we have been at the lows. Uh, we have uh, made right choices and we have made mistakes, but we still have the will to fight for freedom. And I know that I'm talking uh, with, the, with, with the sentiment of millions of Venezuelans that 
like Cubans, like Nicaraguans, who are willing to continue the fight for freedom and democracy, which is a free and fair election for our country. So um, thank you very much and open to, to your questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, much I want to add. I, I want to, <laughs> to, to say uh, a few things. Uh, uh, Leopoldo graduated, as he said, in 1996, and by 2000, he had won uh, an election for mayor. So this is 2022, so the people graduating now, <coughs> uh, I want to know by 2026 what uh, your plans are. Uh, uh, <coughs> Um, which is a message that I think is, is tacit and implicit, that uh, you should think big about your own lives, that uh, you have been given a, an enormous opportunity of coming to this institution, of being surrounded by uh, super brilliant students, uh, and to have had the opportunity to not be too polluted by your professors, uh, but uh, but that uh, you know that doing a lot in a lifetime is possible, and that um, Leopoldo is a, is a good example of of what that means. I I honestly hope that uh, um, you have the chance to do it in a democracy, so you won't have to face the enormous challenges and difficulties that uh, Leopoldo has has had to face. Um, I remember uh, one of the times I, I met Leopoldo was campaigning when he was going to run for for the um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the governor yeah the Cal governor of the of the federal district not not just of the Chacao district but of the whole metropolitan area and um, and that meant walking uh, from Antigua Manau to Montalban. For the Caraqueños, we we'll, you know what it means. It, it's in it sort of like the poor neighborhoods on the west of the city, uh, all the way down down the hill, and and you know saying hello, uh, and, you know shack by shack, house by house, uh, to uh, with a message, with uh, a conversation, with understanding the issues. Um, I. Uh, uh, that election, uh, uh, Leopoldo was unable to participate, but uh, the opposition won that election. Uh, and they won all the... Uh, uh, the Alcaldía Mayor they won, and they won all, all uh, four of the five districts of Caracas. And so we organized um, uh, um, a project here to support those city governments. And, uh, and there I realized how much Leopoldo had transformed the services of Chacao, uh, the police force of Chacao. So he, he's a policy wonk. I mean, you've seen he's eloquent, he, he's charismatic, etc. But if you send him a memo on a policy issue, he will, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, highlight it and stuff and write comments and, and, and come to you. I mean, it's sort of like a term paper that is graded. So I had, um, uh, we had an opportunity to, uh, to work after uh, the National Assembly was elected in December 2015 with a two-thirds majority. Um, uh, we had, he was in jail. Um, I remember uh, uh, you could only, in, in solitary confinement, but he would be taken to, um, to, to uh, the to court. The judge, yeah, to the court. To the court, and while he was at the court, he could write some notes. So he sent me a note uh, with his mother, 
and, uh, and, and she wanted a note back. So I sent her a note back <laughs> during the day of the trial. And he sent me another note back. So, <laughs> so um, and, and this was wonkish stuff. It was not, not you, know, you know, it was wonkish stuff about uh, economic policy. So, um, um, so you can do, you can be a technocrat and you can be a politician. These, this, these are not uh, uh, mutually exclusive. Um, we worked together in that process, generating something that eventually was called uh, Plan Pais, right? Uh, and and uh, he asked me to organize a big event with some 50 leaders of the Venezuelan opposition uh, in September 2018. Everybody was there from all political parties, uh, the church, the trade unions, uh, business associations, uh, civil society, etc. He participated through Zoom because uh, Zoom did not exist in those days, but whatever it was, uh, because he was in, in house arrest. Um, and there, again, all the wonkish stuff about what is exchange rate policy and monetary policy and fiscal policy and oil policy and debt restructuring policy and so on and so forth. He was deep into the, the details of all of this. So uh, I think it's, a, it's an important uh, life example for all of us uh, of how important uh, the things uh, uh, we teach at Harvard are for the world out there, but it requires, it requires leadership, integrity, courage, effort, work uh, to change the world. And I, I think that's, a, that's an important message. So let me finish by asking Leopoldo a question. Okay, so uh, I am a witness of the fact that uh, it's been a gigantic effort uh, to end the dictatorship. And, and not all the time, but for a brief period of time, uh, it was an effort that had a lot of international support, right? Uh, in the 2000s, uh, the first decade of the century, we didn't really have much international support, if any, right? Because uh, Chavez was popular, etc. So at the time where everything was undermined, it, it didn't really, um, it, it was very isolated. We were saying, you know, you can't, uh, you don't understand the destruction that is happening, but, but uh, people saw you as sort of radical or whatever, not, but, but for a while, we did have uh, a support of a significant number of countries, you know. And, so, and we've tried pretty much everything. You want, you know, free and fair elections. We had not necessarily free or fair elections, but we won a two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, uh, only to see all the powers of the National Assembly taken away. So... Um, it, it, we, do we have a, do we have, what have you learned? What have you learned in terms of the paradigms that we have used to get rid of the dictatorship? We all read everything that has ever, was ever written on nonviolence, and, and there are people here teaching nonviolence at Harvard, and all the books have read and have been read and so on. We've tried a thousand different things, uh, what are the lessons? Uh, how do you inform, say, the next stage? Uh, we're going to go to free and fair elections and then uh, uh, say we win those elections. Will power be transferred after those elections? Uh, does, uh, I mean, Trump didn't want to leave, right? Uh, after the election, so would Maduro want to leave? Is there going to be uh, a civil society that will, or, you know, or, or, or an institutional setup that would um, force Maduro to leave the same way that um, Trump was forced to leave, even though he didn't really want them to the last minute. And so, so I mean, um, do we have a theory of change that informs action today as to how to get rid of, uh, of the dictatorship? And how has, say, our 
our, our failures of the past, how do they inform strategy today? So, uh, Ricardo stole my top question. Um, so I'll, but I'll let you get to that in a second, Leopoldo, and I'll, I'll ask another one. Uh, but let me lead off, first of all, by thanking Leopoldo for, for coming. I know you're very busy. We really appreciate uh, the, the time and energy that you've devoted. Uh, I have tremendous, tremendous admiration for Leopoldo. Uh, there are, uh, luckily, luckily, in 21st century Latin America, there are not, outside of Cuba, there have not been many true political prisoners. We're in a very different era than we were in the 1970s. But, uh, but uh, tragically, Leopoldo was a, 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 a real political prisoner, four years in prison, uh, much of it in solitary confinement for opposing a dictatorship. Um, and uh, I also want to echo his call um, for us to give our time and our energy in support of, of liberal democracy at a time when, when it really needs it. Uh, that, and, and make a call for all of us, all of us to support Leopoldo and the, the Venezuelan opposition, especially, especially the political left, which is at a harder time uh, coming around to wholeheartedly supporting democracy, liberal democracy in Venezuela. Um, before I get to a question, let me be uh, a little grumpy, a little ornery. Um, start with, with a, a fact. I, I think we have to be careful about our pessimism regarding democracy. Quick fact. There are more democracies in the world today than during the heady days in which Leopoldo Lopez graduated from the Kennedy School in 1996. There are many more democracies in the world today than there were in the 1990s. We are not suffering a massive democratic recession. There are three or four fewer democracies in the world today than there were at the peak of democratization about 15 years ago. This is not to say that democracy is not challenged, it's being seriously challenged, but we need to keep it in perspective. We're a more democratic world today than we were in the 1990s. Um, and and it's, not, it's not true that we're facing a choice between uh, dysfunctional democracies and functional autocracies. First of all, there are many, still many functional democracies in the world. The United States, unfortunately, is not one of them, but there are many functional democracies in the world. And, but more importantly, there are many, many, many functional, excuse me, dysfunctional autocracies. Venezuela at the top of the list. Um, China is on all of our minds, and China is a pretty functional authoritarian regime. It's also a huge outlier. The vast majority of the world's autocracies perform poorly. Uh, and that's something that we Democrats have in our favor. Um, on this really interesting point about, uh, about the, why the, the, the Maduro government, why the Venezuelan dictatorship survives, uh, despite the fact, despite world historic I mean, the, the, the main cause, there are two big causes of death of authoritarian regimes. Um, one of them is poor economic performance. Generally, dictatorships that perform poor economically are not long for this world. Venezuela survives despite the world's worst economic performance. Another thing that helps to bring authoritarian regimes down is the departure of founding leaders, su leadership succession, especially in a personalistic regime like like Venezuela's was. So Chavez's passing also left the regime vulnerable, and yet it survived. Now, Leopoldo offers, and I, I agree with you, Leopoldo, that it is not that to, to point to the opposition as the reason why the regime survives is, is fallacious. Venezuela has had a strikingly strong Venezuela, uh, opposition uh, that, that mobilized in, in extraordinary numbers in 2002, that mobilized in extraordinary numbers in 2014, at several points during the, uh, in, in between, um, and that has generally maintained a, a striking degree of unity in spite of incredible fragmentation, and as Leopoldo pointed out, has tried everything, has tried every strategy known to humankind. Um, it's, it's, it's not the opposition's fault that the regime survives. So why does it? Um, and I want to just uh, push on this, this issue that, that it's international support. And to some degree, it certainly is. And there's no question 
that powerful autocracies across the world, beginning with China, Russia, also Iran, and very importantly, Cuba, have provided critical resources for the regime that, is, that has prevented it from being isolated. That is true. Um, but I wouldn't overstate the degree to which autocracies are, um, are unified. The, I would not overstate the degree to which autocracies are somehow ideologically committed to helping other autocracies survive you know, beyond the, 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 the bounds of rationality. That's just not true. Auto, auto, each individual autocratic government, from Russia to China to Cuba and Iran, one, is primarily concerned about its own survival. Two, in most cases, China is the exception, in most cases, has a lot of domestic problems at hand, is, has a lot to worry about in terms of its own domestic survival. They're happy to support the Maduro government if the stakes are low, if the costs are low. But if at any point, in any of these cases, any of these cases, the cost of supporting the Maduro government rises above the, the, the relatively marginal benefit of balancing against the United States, which is what these guys are doing. They're, they're balancing against the United States, which emerged out of the 1990s as the dominant global power. The minute that becomes costly, they will defect. There's very, very little binding together Russia and Iran and Turkey and China and Cuba. Um, and so one of the things that, we should, that, that the US government, but also opposition, should be doing is thinking about ways to, uh, to, to break them apart, to, to create incentives for them to not be aligned. And I, I want to suggest that that's not that difficult. Um, and so my question is, is this. Um, I, I find really intriguing and impressive this idea of a, of, um, a transnational liberal democratic alliance. I think it's incredibly important. My, my question is this. We're living in a world of um, pretty intense polarization. We see it in Latin America. Uh, we see it elsewhere in the world. And um, so it's, it's pretty easy for me to see how you guys are able and, and would be uh, relatively easily able to work with oppositions, with Cuban opposition, with Nicaraguan opposition. How do you build alliances with left-wing opposition to right-wing autocracies? Um, how do you establish a dialogue with folks on the political left who for way too long have been in the, in the Chavista camp, or had been? And I think concretely about the, the neighborhood in Venezuela, because I think among the most important international actors are Venezuela's neighbors, are Brazil and Colombia and, and, and other regional players, maybe Mexico. And we are, for better or worse, staring at a scenario possibly where next year both Brazil and Colombia are, again, are governed by the left. We could be, uh, Lula could be headed for the presidency in Brazil, Petro could be headed for the presidency in Colombia. So what, what can you guys do to strengthen ties and to build the trust of left-wing Democrats, uh, which I think would help to strengthen your, your transnational coalition. Um, I'll say, I got more questions, but I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, these are easy questions, all of them. <laughs> how to get rid of Maduro, how to do a transition, how to, <laughs> how to bring about world peace. Strengthening global democracy. <laughs> Strengthening global democracy. No, I, I, I appreciate the questions. and. And the challenge to the, to the idea, um, as you said, there has been a recession over the past 16 years in democracies, right? Over the past 16 years, there are less democracies today. Um, Three but, or four? Uh, Three but or but four. they're less. I mean, there's, there's, there hasn't been a rise. <laughs> there hasn't been a rise. And, and there is at least more, more autocratic regimes. I, I, do, I do share with you that the discontent with democracy uh, I think it's overstated as well, and, and, and that's my point to why we should call for um, the defense of the democratic system. I mean, I, I, I do believe that there is a crisis, or at least I, I, I perceive that there is not the same enthusiasm to talk about issues around freedom and democracy today as we had during the 90s. So, so that was my point. Um, and, and for the fact, for the, your, point of the network. No, it's, it's as you say, it, it's 
not an articulated uh, on every aspect uh, a network of autocracies, but they do work in ways in which they support each other. And I uh, propose the following analysis that we've done. It. If you look with the case of Venezuela, the voting uh, around the issues that have to do with Venezuela in the National Security, um, um, in, in the Security Council of the, of the UN, but also in the Human Rights Council, also in the environmental issues. In, in all of those aspects, when the case of Venezuela comes, you see the same vote aligned of all of these countries with the same arguments. And I mean, and that, that's just to show that there is an articulation, not among all of the aspects, as you say, but they are articulated. In the case of Venezuela, and I know that this is not the same with other countries, we can show the way in which Iran, Turkey, Cuba, Russia, um, and, uh, and, and Belarusia, and China, they all have different ways to support Maduro. Uh, so maybe Venezuela is an extreme case, but we do have the, the, not even their support, there is also immigration. If you talk to Venezuelans today, they will tell you that not only in Caracas, but in Maracaibo and in Valencia, there is an, an increasing population of people coming from Iran, from Turkey, from Russia. Um, the tourist that is going today to Margarita Island is coming from, uh, from Russia. Two times a week, there is a direct flight before the war between uh, Moscow and, and Margarita Island. So my point is that, that, this, is, that this is something that, uh, that we have seen uh, happening. Um, to your point, in order for this to be a truly um, effective way of defending democracy, it needs to go beyond the ideological divides. And, and I fully agree with that. And I think ideology in that sense is a privilege of democracies, you know, in a way that we in Venezuela, I mean, it doesn't really matter what, what ideology you have um, because you don't, if you don't have a free and fair election, uh, you, you really don't have any way to, um, to, to express your ideology in ways that are, are going to change things. Um, so as you said, and I agree with that, this rise in autocracy is not uh, the monopoly of the left of or the right. It's not so in the world, and it's not so in our continent. So in our continent, we have Nicaragua, Cuba, um, and Venezuela as clearly dictatorships. We have countries like uh, Argentina uh, that are well moving towards an autocratic path in, in some ways. But you also have, uh, but you also have, uh, you have Brazil and, and and El Salvador. You can argue that from the right, uh, they are also having some expressions of. Uh, of, of autocratic um, expressions. So yes, I, I, I agree with you that this is not something that is ideological. How to bring the, the left uh, to the discussion? Well, in the case uh, of, of us, it has been a great challenge in, in the continent for many years, as Ricardo said, uh, when the continent was primarily uh, governed by, by many leftist governments, it was very, very difficult for us to express what was happening in Venezuela. Was, uh, we, were, we were treated as crazy people when we were talking about what was happening in our country. We would come to, to other countries and say, you know, we're losing our voting rights, you know, being disqualified to run for office for no reason. Well, the, you, must, you must have done something. Uh, or, you know, there was always an, an excuse. So I, I do think that uh, that, that is uh, a challenge. But I think that trying to put this on an ideological uh, realm is... Um, it, it, it's, it's not the best way to, to find the, the, the support, um, rather that we should go to uh, trying to find the support towards free and fair elections. And this takes me to Ricardo's questions. You know, what do we do? We've done everything. And, and as you said before, we've done everything. We have, we've protested, not once, but thousands of times. We have uh, voted, not once, but many, many times. We've lost elections and we've won elections. Uh, we have negotiated. We've negotiated effectively and we have negotiated ineffectively. Uh, so we've done everything. And if you ask me what's the way forward, it's to try, um, to, to try whatever can take us to a free and fair election. And today, we have an opportunity to bring all of the support to a free and fair presidential and parliamentary election. Um, that is something that brings together all of the Venezuelan opposition today. 
Uh, during, the, during 2019, there was this idea that all options were on the table. And looking back and at those days, I can tell you that, that that thesis might have been problematic because we were you know, dealing at the same time with different alternatives. And we weren't able to focus in one clear alternative. And it was clear that that was an option for the Venezuelan people, that more than 25% of the Venezuelan people at some point supported uh, military external intervention. Uh, and that happened because there was a clear signaling coming from the US that that, that, that was an opportunity, that, that was something that they were thinking about. But in private, they would tell us, no, that's never going to happen. But in public, there were hints that that was a possibility. And that divided the Venezuelan opposition. And that divided the possibilities to have a common path to see uh, where we should put uh, all of our efforts. So um, I think that we need to focus in, uh, in having uh, the conditions to have a free and fair election. Um, I know it's not easy, um, but I think that this is the one path that we can go forward, that we can mobilize uh, the Venezuelan people around that idea, and that we can, um, that, that, that we need to think through how a transition could happen uh, in Venezuela. It's not going to be an easy transition like, like any transitions are, and there are going to be compromises today, there is a possibility that has been on the, on, on the table of discussion of a negotiation. And that negotiation is really about elections on one hand and, and sanctions on the other. I mean, we want elections and the regime wants the sanctions to be lifted. And that's the core of the negotiation. And the regime needs uh, the sanctions to be lifted. I believe that it would be a great mistake to lift sanctions if there is uh, no compromises to democratize our country. Because that's the only possibility that we have to bring about free and fair elections in Venezuela. So that brings us to what type of elements that we have. Well, we have sanctions. And I know that there is an entire discussion around the use of sanctions. I, I think that sanctions is the only thing that can put us in a negotiation table uh, to bring about a free and fair election in Venezuela. Without sanctions, there wouldn't be a possibility of, uh, of, of sitting down with the regime and thinking about uh, a free and fair election in our country. That's, uh, so that leads to, you know, what, what's the use of sanctions? I believe that sanctions are useful. Uh, I believe that personal sanctions are useful. I believe that around sanctions, there has been an issue of implementation. I think that they could be more effectively implemented around the individuals that are subject to the, the sanctions and also of the general sanctions. But without sanctions, and it's become clear after the invasion of Russia to Ukraine, that that is one of the few tools that, uh, that democracies have in order to exert pressure on autocratic regimes. If I could just insist on one, one last part of my question, and then I want to go to, to questions of the public, which is, um, and this gets to Ricardo's question of what do you do if you do if, if you're able to have a, a competitive election but the regime doesn't then doesn't want to yield. Imagine how useful the PT and Petro could, in theory, be in twisting these guys' arms. How do you convince the PT to not behave the way it did in its previous terms in office, where they basically protected? the Chavista government? Well, that's a, I mean, that, that, that's a difficult question. And I think that um, in a way they need to have, you know, their own interests. Uh, they, they, Let me ju yeah. just, in, what, is there an example with the current Chilean government? Have they shown any interest in? Well, it's been, Boric has said very clearly two weeks ago that what Venezuela needs is a free and fair election and that they would come in to do everything that is needed in order to have a free and fair election. So that, that's, uh, that's what Chile has said over the past weeks. No, and I don't, I don't, I don't know to your answer, Professor, of how to bring you know, Petro and how to bring the PT. I, I am personally very... Um, so very, very doubtful of, of the intentions that, of, or, or the consequences, for example, of, a, of, a, of, of Petro in, in Colombia to Venezuela, because it has been very clear the relationship that they have with, a, um, with, with the guerrilla groups um, and, uh, and very open to being supportive in a way to, to, to Chavez at, at its time. 
now there is a strategic distance uh, between uh, Petro and Maduro, but I don't know if that's going to hold uh, if Petro gets to win the election. But Petro as president has a whole set of interests that he doesn't have to consider when he's an opposition leader or a mayor. And uh, the, the, it's incredibly costly, the, the, the number of Venezuelans that have fled into Colombia. A, a solution to the problem in Venezuela serves the Colombian interests. So I think there's, it's not easy, but I think there's room for, for conversation. Let me uh, turn to questions from the audience. Uh, we have folks with microphones who will uh, chase you, but um, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, Leopoldo. I'm Miguel. I'm from Colombia. Um, I was in the city council when Petro was mayor, so I know him. I am doing my master here, but I did a PhD in Petro, so I know him. Uh, and basically, uh, he's a risk. He supported Chavez 24 years ago. He has been supporting Maduro and Chavez. And Maduro and Chavez supported him for all these years. And as you said, they are distance now as a political, probably, uh, strategy. But also, uh, this is not about left or right. Uh, Petro has a position in the left, within the left. There is a lot of politicals in the left that are basically um, uh, stating the risk that Petro's represent. So my question is this. Uh, we don't want to leave what Venezuela lived 24 years ago. Petro has been showing us that he wants to do exactly what Chavez did 24 years ago. He's asking for a constitutional changes, as Petro, as Chavez did, and he has he he has demonstrated a lot of time, even from the mayor's office, that he doesn't um, he doesn't believe in rule of, of law. We lived tw one year ago, even worse than the pandemic. We w we had a protests in Colombia, um, where Petro celebrated violence because basically he was pushing against the establishment or what we uh, or what what he called the establishment so my, my question is what do you think we should do in two more less than two months we are going to have our second round of election what can we do what's the what's what is your advice for the young people that is here that we we want to do politics uh, just you, for you to know I became elected senator two months ago in Colombia one month ago in Colombia So I'm going to be in the Senate with Petro president or with him in the Senate as a colleague or But the point is what we can do what we, we have 20 more days to save our de democracy in Colombia Well, I, I don't know exactly um, You know the, the, the Dynamic of the election at this point, but uh, I mean in general just to be to be engaged and uh, and I mean, I don't know if, if at this point, talking about Venezuela um, hurts or helps uh, whatever position in the election. I know that it has been, the issue of Venezuela has been very present in the previous election when Duque was elected. And I know in previous elections in Latin America, I don't know if the issue of Venezuela today is something that the electorate are, are looking at as, uh, uh, as something that they, that they value or they fear or because they don't want to become Venezuela. Uh, they they rather not vote for Petro. I mean, I, I don't I don't know exactly you know what the what the dynamic is, but uh, but my advice is to do exactly what you're doing to be engaged. I mean, you're already a senator, and I think that the only way to change politics is to be involved in politics. I mean, you don't win the game by by buying a ticket to watch the game. I mean, you win the game if you are willing to play the game. You win you win if you are willing to take the risks to go into politics and and to take the risks of of, of what that means. And in countries like ours, it's very, very risky because uh, going into politics in our countries and particularly in, I can tell you, in, in Venezuela, it takes you to, to the limit. And, uh, and, but if you are willing to, to defend your, your values and your ideas to, to that extent, go into politics. But you're already doing that, as you said. So I, I encourage you to, to continue to be involved. I had a discussion today with uh, some some students, and they asked the same question, and I gave the same answer. Go back to your country. I mean, we, we have here a group of people who are very talented, very privileged, um, and you can agree or not with, whatever, with what we are saying, but uh, many of you are from Latin America, and many, uh, many of you have a challenge to go back to, to our countries because you can make a change going back to your country. I mean, of course, that's not your 20-day answer to your question. I have a magical... I don't have a magical varita, but... Uh. 
but uh, but you need to just be be involved as you are already. Hi, um, thank you, Leopoldo, for making time and for, for sharing all of this with us. So my name is Gina. Um, I'm an MPA uh, student, and I'm originally from Honduras. Um, so you more than anyone know how hard it is for opposition parties to achieve electoral victories under authoritarian regimes. Uh, but in Honduras, after a 12-year government uh, where the incumbent party had you know, constructed what was, by all appearances, a, a durable, competitive authoritarian regime, the opposition won last year uh, with a landslide victory. And so the strategy was building like sort of a mass party grassroots organization uh, with US support, I might add, and continually participating in elections. So, so the opposition leaders avoided the temptation to abstain from, from participating in elections, which I know the opposition in Venezuela has, has done, just abstained, um, because it's understandable, right? Conditions um, grow increasing, increasingly unfair. And lastly, forging unity through power sharing. So brokering a power sharing agreement that produced like a coalition capable of mobilizing this mass protest vote against the ruling party. So my question is, do you see this um, being possible at some point in Venezuela? What being possible? Like a power sharing agreement or the, any of the three strategies, like opposition participating in elections or you know, brokering a sort of power sharing agreement. Well, I, I think that participating or not, or not in an election, it shouldn't be a, a dogmatic position. I mean, it, it should be a pragmatic position. I think not participating in the 2018 election uh, was, was, was the right thing to do at the time because um, there was n no way that that was going to be a fair election. Uh, we clearly knew that Maduro was going to win that election uh, and we knew that the election was a fraud. So not participating in that election, I think it was the right thing to do because the consequence to Maduro was that he was stripped from his legitimacy. I mean, the day after that election, that election was not recognized by many countries. And six months or eight months after that election, uh, the, at least several countries decided to not recognize Maduro as legitimate president, to recognize Juan Guaido as a legitimate president. I mean, we can discuss how that evolved, and, and I have, of course, my opinions and my experience on that, but I think that was the right thing to do at the time. Uh, but there are other times when participating in an election, uh, it, it's the right thing to do. Like in 2015, we went to that election uh, with doubts about the system, but things turn out that we were able to win the election. However, we won the election, but we lost the consequence of winning an election because the, the, the regime did immediately before they stripped out uh, the two-thirds majority, uh, and then they took away from the National Assembly the possibility of doing any meaningful uh, make any meaningful decisions uh, because they controlled the National Assembly using the, the Supreme Court. Um, but, but I think that, uh, again, that, that, that's tactical. Of what you say about grassroots activism, I, I think that's a way, that, that, that's something that, that we need to do in any scenario. I mean, that's something that we cannot stop doing. And, and it's not easy, uh, especially when the situation, the economic situation is so difficult. But I believe that that needs to be a priority. And, and that's something that we have continued to do um, is to build the base of grassroots activism that has been capable of showing the, the, the possibility of winning. In November of last year, there was a regional election and uh, we decided to participate. And in one of the states that, that we won was the Barina state. And uh, we won that election because of a grassroots organization that has been building there for many years. Uh, but then the, the, the regime decided that they didn't like the person that won and they decided to disqualify the person that won, Freddy Superlano, after he, won, he had won. Not before registering to the election, but after he had won. So yes, all of, all of this bring doubts of, of what could happen if we go to an election and then, uh, and then the regime decides, as you say, not to, not to give, uh, not to give uh, power. But in, I think that there is no better moment to have uh, a show of force than an election. Uh, because an election can combine the two possibilities to show numbers. I mean, you, you, in order to show numbers in a, in a tete to tete against an autocracy, you have really two ways of doing that, through protests and through elections. And if you organize and you win the election, but then you have the determination 
to go out and protest and, and to take the streets if the, if the regime decides to steal the election, well, you at least have the possibility of, of organizing uh, that, 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 that difficult door opening, but organizing nevertheless. Hi, uh, my name is Isabella, and I am a student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, so I'm out of this bubble, but um, I'm Venezuelan-American. Um, and uh, my question is more about how, I guess, kind of tagging into the grassroots um, comment, but it seems that uh, f free and fair elections are kind of the ultimate thing that you get to in the end. Um, and I'm wondering how it is that the opposition right now can think about different um, policies or um, even like grassroots efforts that help to maybe educate the electorate or even move the electorate in a certain direction um, towards action or towards um, maybe even preparing for when they do have the vote, how to make those decisions. No, that, that, I mean, that, that's what we are doing. I mean, that's what all political parties and, and, and movements are doing with, with great levels of difficulty. But, but we need to be careful because sometimes I, I hear some arguments saying, well, we shouldn't focus in, 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 in political issues. We should focus on the problems of the people. And that, you know, that's, that's right. Um, and well, Ricardo came with me and others when we did a lot of that type of grassroots activism with social issues, but always with, with an idea of, of, of making that political. Um, in Venezuela, the one thing that unifies the people the most is to either vote or protest against Maduro. I mean, there is no other issue that will unify the Venezuelan people from the bottom up um, that is their willingness to do something in order to get rid of the dictatorship. And that has been shown over and over. So there is no mobilizing issue. People will not mobilize for fresh water, for uh, food, for medicine, even the, that these are vital issues. People will not mobilize for these issues. They will mobilize uh, through protest and voting um, because of their commitment to make political change happen. And again, we, we, we have seen this many times. So grassroots activism, grassroots organization can give you the, the stepping stone to that. But at some point, all of that needs to be put into a path to, to, to well, do something, uh, either an election or protest to um, try to make political change happen. Internal pressure, that's a type of internal pressure that I believe we need to continue to build. And external pressure, as we said, uh, will focus sanctions and other mechanisms that there are um, available to, to, to other countries and that need to be used. And I think that this is something that, that if we look back um, at what happened, um, there are some lessons learned around sanctions. There are some lessons learned about how to combine the, the moments of the internal pressure with the external pressure. But grassroots activism, as you say, it's, it's, it's critical. Hi, I'm Mauricio. I am MPA AD on the Kennedy School. I'm from El Salvador, so first, thanks for acknowledging the situation in my country. Um, I have two questions. One is, is you mentioned that Maduro is still in power because he's not isolated for, from the international community. So I was wondering, you talk about sanctions, but I was wondering what other tools do we have to, I mean the Venezuelan people has to bring down the regime. And my other question is, why do you think that democracy has under-delivered? Well, the, the question of, of the under-delivery of, uh, of democracy, I mean, I think that the entire Kennedy School should give that answer, you know, it's not, um, but um, I, I think that if, if that, that issue is not addressed, it's very difficult to defend democracy because it's very difficult to defend democracy when the population is, is going through very um, oh, oh, hunger and, and other types of, of hardships. And I think that, the, uh, that maybe the, the questioning of democracy is because of the under-delivery to, to, of, of, of many issues and that opens for possibility of autocrats to come in and to, to present formulas to solve uh, the, the problems of the people um, in ways that are not democratic. So I think that's a risk of the the under-delivery of, uh, of democracies that we have seen. Um, and, and your other question, again, what, what things can we do? 
it's, it's very difficult and very frustrating because we have done everything, as I said before. We have, I mean, literally, we have tried everything. And what we need to do, continue to try everything. Towards what goal? Towards having a scenario where we have free and fair elections. And, 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 and that's not, there's not going to be one answer. I mean, there is not one strategic path. There is not one theory of change. We have spent hours and hours and hours talking about theories of change. And, and in the end, there is, I think that there is not, not, not one way because the circumstances um, evolve, they change, you know, the, the internally and externally. Um, but what I think needs to be a commitment is to focus all of our energy to have a free and fair election for different reasons, at least for me. One, because I, well, I am a Democrat and I think that this is, um, th this is what we have been fighting for, is the rights of the people. But two, is that I think that if we have a transition that is not the result of, a, of an election, that, that it's going to be a very weak uh, government. And it's in the circumstances that we have seen in our country, it's not going to last. So the only way we can have a, a, a government that has the capacity to, to govern, to take decisions, and, and to last is if it has the, the legitimacy and the support of the people. And you can only get that through elections. And, and so that is another reason why uh, our focus needs to be a free and fair election. And thirdly, that this is something that I believe it's could be supported from the right, from the left, from the center. I mean, having uh, calling for free and fair elections is something that um, somebody can only deny if they are not Democrats. So, uh, and I know all the doubts uh, around the possibility of having a free and fair election in Venezuela. But again, this is the only issue that can unify all of the sectors internally and externally. Thank you so much for everything. My name is Claudia. I'm actually from the Fletcher School, not from Harvard. And I'm also from Venezuela, so thank you personally for all you've done. My question is regarding non-state armed groups. You've mentioned the pillars of support and the international support that Maduro has had. And you briefly mentioned how illicit activities have also sustained the government. So seeing if they've benefited and they've made a symbiotic relationship with them, how do you believe a transition would happen and they would clearly present the challenge to it. So if you're considering in that spectrum, thank you. No, I, I appreciate your question. I, I was talking briefly to, to Professor Hausman before, before coming here. And well, I, I have a particular view of, of what Venezuela is, is, is today and it's particularly the Venezuelan economy. I think the Venezuelan economy today is an economy of the illicit, a dark economy. It's like if you had the, the the internet and then you have the dark web. Well, Venezuela is on the dark web, on the illicit. And, uh, and, and the, the activities that support the economy in Venezuela today are the, um, the gold transactions, the cocaine trafficking, the dark oil transactions, money laundering, uh, and that all is organized and articulated as an organized crime structure. So I think that one, the, if, if somebody wants to study the political economy, the political dynamic of Venezuela, uh, rather than understanding or figuring out the structure of the, st of the Venezuelan state or the laws, which are meaningless, really. I mean, the laws don't, don't, are, don't, don't, are not a restriction for anything in Venezuela, nor the structure of the state. But what we really need to understand more clearly is the structure of this illicit uh, economy and to understand the political economy behind this because that's where the power structure is. And that power structure is not um, under the formal institutions of the state. So those are the powerful people that are today managing um, the, the Venezuelan economy that, as you know, has collapsed 80% of the GDP in the past eight years, but that 20% of the economy is an economy that allows the regime to have a very big cash flow. Uh, and it has a very big cash flow because of this, uh, this, 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 this uh, reality of an illicit economy. And within that, the non-org groups are part of that, or part, certainly part of the, of, of the um, cocaine trafficking in the border with Colombia. Hi, um, my name is Danilo. I'm from Venezuela as well. Uh, and my question is, for both Professor Hausman and you, Leopoldo. Um, so basically, what do you have to say about the unity of the opposition? Because you say it's a, it's an easy way out, but then 
I would assume that there's, at some degree, it looks now that uh, the opposition is completely segregated uh, in a way. And that, to me, sends the wrong signal because I actually left the country like not very long ago. And so people, it's in their minds sometimes they start thinking like, if I have to leave with the Chavismo, I better get rid of the sanctions and that's actually, or you know, other things. I will try to engage with the government in some, at some level and that it's actually very harmful for the transition process that we're looking for. So what do you think uh, it should be the strategy and specifically related to unity looking forward? And then if you could comment about the current state of the YDO government, because it's obvious that we have not achieved the goal so far. And believe me, I, I thought, you know, at the beginning this could work, but uh, sincerely, like now, it looks uh, weak, and that's a major concern for many leaders, and I suppose you are among them, because he's part of your um, coalition, political body. And uh, uh, yeah, so basically, those basically those two questions and thank you in advance no thank you I appreciate your question well the, the first thing is that um, it is true that there are uh, problems within within the unity of, uh, of the opposition in Venezuela but it's also true in Cuba in Nicaragua in Iran in Belarus I mean it's a trait of autocracies I mean I, and I've been very very surprised to to share with, with uh, the, the experiences with other leaders and, and movements from these countries, you know, how difficult it is to maintain unity uh, of the opposition movements under autocracies. I mean, it's a huge challenge. Having said that, the Venezuelan opposition has been capable of stepping up to the plate at the critical moments. Um, even though, I mean, we have been uh, there have been moments of, of uh, very high unity and moments of low unity. But uh, at the critical moments, we have been united. Um, in 2015, we went with a unified platform to win the, the National Assembly. We won with two-thirds of, of, the, of the vote. And we won because we were united. And um, this process has been long. We have tried everything. And it's also been a process of cycles. Uh, there has been moments of high mobilization, high enthusiasm, and then because the expectations were not met, those moments were followed with um, frustration, uh, with disenchantment, and lack of mobilization. And we have seen that from 2002 until to 2022. I mean, it's been a cycle. And now we are in the bottom part of that cycle uh, again. But I, as you, many Venezuelans might remember the year 2018. It was a very bad year for us. I mean, Maduro had just stole the election. Um, and there was nothing on the horizon. The National Assembly was not, not, doing, not doing much. There was no unity. Uh, the announcements of, uh, of, of the unity of the political parties were that we were separating from, from each other. And then just months after that, uh, the cycle, you know, turned the, the tide in the different direction. Guaido was recognized as, uh, as uh, you know, interim president. There was high mobilization, uh, and, and it really got the attention. But that has happened many times over the past 20 years. What I am saying is that our challenge is to build um, the rising part of that cycle again. We've done it before. We need to do it again. And that's what we are doing. So we have, around those lines, two main challenges. The, the first is to articulate a, a platform where we can have the highest representation of different political parties. Um, so far, or over the past years, we've been working with what's called the, the G4, the Group of Four, the, what's called the, the largest political parties within the opposition. And, and I think that, the, that, that has, um, the, the moment for that, it's, it's already gone. I think it's dysfunctional uh, to pretend to lead the opposition only from those parties. Uh, I think that, or not, not that we are, not only that I think that, but we are working in a platform that includes other political parties. Uh, but the challenge, and we are working on that, is to have clear rules of engagement of political parties and political actors uh, of how decisions are going to be made 
and how the, the entire process of uh, building and growing the coalition is going to happen. And linked with that, or second challenge, is how to do a primary. Because that's what's really going to build a new cycle of, uh, of unity in Venezuela. There is no way to build a new cycle without some sort of legitimacy. And the legitimacy that we are looking to, 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 um, to have for this new phase is the legitimacy of the people. So we are organizing a process of primaries uh, that I hope they take place in, by the end of this year or early next year. Uh, in my view, and this is my personal view, um, not necessarily what is going to happen. I think it's insufficient only to elect the, a presidential candidate, uh, especially if we don't have an election uh, date or we don't have an election in the horizon. Um, I think that that primary should elect mm, not just one person, but a group of people, and not only within Venezuela, but also include the, the diaspora and have representation of the Venezuelans uh, elsewhere. So we can have the voice of the Venezuelans uh, be heard with, with the legitimacy that they were elected as the representatives of the Venezuelans in Spain or in the US or in Florida or in and, or the same way that it should happen in, in, uh, in the regions of Venezuela. So those are two things that we are, that we are working towards uh, in, in this moment. Um, and with respect to Guaido, I, I need to say a couple of things. The first is that I, I, I admire the courage of, of Juan Guaido. I mean, he's in, in Venezuela. He's been um, isolated. He, many people believe that you know, he's, with, because of the title of being an interim president, he has some sort of prerogative or some sort of privilege. I mean, that, that's very far from the reality. I mean, his family has been uh, persecuted. He needs to move from one place to another because you know, he has been attacked by, by, and the threat of taking him to prison is it, permanently there. Um, he has been very um, working with a, with a unifying spirit. And the frustration is a frustration that, that I truly understand. Because when Guaido came uh, as interim president, I mean, the, the, the hope was that you know, this was going to end in the end of the dictatorship. And that didn't happen. And of course, the, the result of that has been frustration. However, having said that, today Guaido still is the highest valued Venezuelan leader uh, within the opposition. But politics as a whole has taken a, a big Tall. I mean, not just uh, the the leaders from the opposition, but also from the regime. Politics as a whole, people are disengaging from politics. People are not part of uh, as as it was before, part of the the political discussion uh, as it happened, you know, some some years ago. So one of the challenges that we have is to re-engage the people in the political discussion uh, that uh, that needs to take place. And in my view. The primaries are an opportunity for that. And if we are capable of setting a date for an election, for a presidential and parliamentary election, that will also engage the people with a concrete horizon. Because today, we look at the future, and, and the future, you know, it's, 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 it's um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a concrete date or a concrete path. So in order to, for people to have a faith, there needs to be a promised land. We need to picture what the promised land looks like. And, and I think that with a date of the election that, that could um, reignite the mobilization and the th enthusiasm of the people. We have time for one final question. I have to ask that it be uh, brief. Let, let me just answer. Sure. I, I want to say <clears throat> I'm really excited about this idea of the primary. Because the way uh, negotiations within the opposition have happened, uh, they have happened without any electoral legitimacy. There was a picture taken in 2010 where there was more or less some election, and that defined uh, relative powers of the f these four parties. And since 2010, they have never gone back to the people to ask for a mandate. So it, the, the relative weights of the parties have been frozen since 2010. 
That's one of the reasons why it's probably very problematic to push the idea of the primary, because some of those political parties are going to become very, very small. Um, uh, and the reason why democracies are more complicated than autocracies is because they aggregate preferences, and in the process of aggregating preferences, it's hard to get, make people to uh, agree, and oftentimes it ends up in, in gridlock. And the frustration Americans have about the political system is that nothing gets done because uh, you don't get the majorities in Congress to pass laws, and many laws that have approval don't get done, etc. right? Well, that happens in the Venezuelan opposition because you need all parties to agree, and everybody has a veto, and they need the veto to play for any small advantage for their little party, and, and that weakens the whole process. So having an election where there's a clear mandate to somebody or to some group or to, this is to a structure, I think is, is critical for that structure to function, to be able to make decisions, to be able to act, because uh, the current system has sort of like the worst of parliamentarism, uh, um, and, and um, so I, I, I really would like to see that, uh, uh, that primary happen. It's, it's very important that there be more political competition within the Venezuelan opposition. It's not hard, difficult, it's not easy to do because you're trying to run a free and fair election in a dictatorship that wants to undermine your capacity to organize. So, I mean, there are very good reasons why it hasn't happened. But I think uh, if it were to happen, uh, it would have extremely salutary effects in terms of, uh, of um, um, redetermining what is the political leadership that Venezuelans want to see. Thank you for the talk, Leopoldo. I'll keep it short. My question is about the role of the U.S. in the tension you mentioned between sanctions and free and fair elections. So given the interest the U.S. has in looking for alternate sources of uh, global energy supplies and the meetings that U.S. and Venezuelan officials held recently around this topic, uh, do you think the involvement of the U.S. could tip the balance towards the lifting of uh, or the easing of sanctions without the guarantee of free and fair elections? I hope not, <laughs> and I have read the public statements and I have heard the private statements very clearly from the U.S. government saying that the only way in which the sanctions are going to be lifted is if there is significant progress through the Mexico negotiations. I mean, they have stated this several times. Juan Gonzalez uh, from uh, the White House, uh, who was one of the people who went to Venezuela six weeks ago, uh, said this just last week. Uh, and, and I think that this is uh, an opportunity, again, because sanctions are there as a means to an end, not as an end in itself. And, and the end uh, that has been clearly stated formally and politically is to bring about uh, political change through free and fair elections in Venezuela. So if, if sanctions are used um, and are lifted, and, and the counterpart of that is that we have uh, more guarantees for an election, that, that we have the date for the election, that there is clarity around what the conditions for that election is going to be. I think that that's, that's a good use of, uh, of, of what sanctions, because in, that's why sanctions were there in the first place. Sanctions were not imposed to stay there until, uh, on, 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 um, until something different happens. It's, just, it's a means to an end. Um, and, and again, I, I hope that that is the position that continues to be the position of, uh, of the U.S. government. That's what they've said privately and in public. I unfortunately uh, need to close. I want to thank all of you for coming. And before thanking uh, our, our guests, I want to give a shout out to uh, the Dr. Class team, Jill and Hime, Pao, Tiago, Andy, who worked their tushes off to make this, uh, this event happen. Uh, also, thank you to our own Ricardo Hausman and especially to Leopoldo Lopez. We hope to have you back here soon as a regular democratic politician rather than an opposition leader. <laughs> thank you.